Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 64 of Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today, I have a very special guest. He is the CEO and co-founder of Digital Works, a mobile software development company. An entrepreneur through and through, he founded his first company in the technology sector in 1998. In 2012, he began teaching web engineering and mobile software development at Heilbronn University. Since 2017, he's a technical lead advisor at Blackman Secure Communication, as well as a lead architect at building the agriculture IoT platform, large scale demonstrator of Katana Project on the Horizon 2020, and member of the advisory board of DigitCode, a company focusing on the improvement of reliable communications for the Internet of Things. As part of the European Commission's Future Internet Program, he supports and builds startups in the field of e-health and industrial IoT. In this function, he coaches small medium enterprises and startups in the European SME Instrument and Pi Business Program. He's a member of the IOTA Evangelist Network to promote blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. He also co-founded a new venture, Aspen.io, to provide secure open source space update and patch delivery system for the Internet of Things. He's a well-practiced international speaker and coach on the field of open innovation, Internet of Things, IoT security, and disruptive business modeling. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome the one and only Mirko Ross. Welcome, Mirko. Wow, what uh, introduction. <laughs> really, this was a long introduction, and uh, it was a pleasure to hear all what I have done in the past and all the ventures now I'm engaged for the future. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and it's so exciting talking to you. And jumping right in with regards to that wonderful introduction, I've seen statistics where researchers estimate that there will be 50 billion connected devices by 2020. Now, we've all heard about recent hacks such as connected printers mining bitcoins and gas stations dispensing unlimited fuel. As connected devices are becoming more prevalent and numerous in our homes, how can we ensure that they stay up to date in terms of security? Um, that's a good question. For, I think for sure we can't be sure. That's the main topic I'm telling the people that we have to accept that the world we are stepping in with this everything connected world. And if it's 50 billion devices or 20 or 13, however, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's just a lot. Um, that in this world, uh, security is no longer existing. So we have to change our strategies. So um, one strategy is to be, uh, to provide more resilience, for example, uh, in the IT environments we are building. And uh, for example, one building blocks is um, to provide strategies to keep IoT devices, even if they are on the edge, for example, up to date, to provide patches, to make instant patching, stuff like that. So I think we have, we have to create more agile environments. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, patching is so important because what was true yesterday no longer applies to today. Um, now, one of the challenges that we're going to be facing with 50 billion or 100 billion or even 20 billion, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that number may be a bit exaggerated, but somewhere in between, right, there are a lot of connected devices, more than a billion for sure. Um, many of these devices are developed overseas in countries like China, where they're being selected for their price, as opposed to uh, how secure they are. Nowadays, there may be more of a uh, cognizant uh, process in making that selection. But a year ago or two years ago, people were more price conscious than security conscious. What kind of solutions, if any, are there in order to either patch or protect your network from these unsecured devices? Yes, um, uh, wh whatever we do, we need the vendors um, to get aware of that. That's that's for sure. So, and there are several ideas how vendors can get aware of providing sustainable, patchable devices. 
Uh, one strategy is liability. So if vendors are getting more liable for what they are doing, they will change their strategy. Um, that's what we see, for example, now in Europe, that there's a big discussion about liability. And I think even in the US, you have this discussion with every data breach uh, happening or every broken device where data is gone or um, money is lost or whatever, we are going to this liability discussion. So I believe, yes, liability is important. And when vendors are getting more liable, they will think about how can they keep their devices they have shipped in thousands or millions uh, uh, out to the market. How can they provide, for example, security by keeping them up to date? Which is not so easy because, um, as you said, we have this kind of long supply chain. So. For example, the device is manufactured in China, okay, and even the Chinese manufacturers, they have to earn money, then you have, um, but you have maybe product development and design in the US. Uh, but how to keep, you know, keep the supply chain conscious for that it's not, of course, it's about money that you can produce and sell devices for revenues. Uh, but it's also important to keep them running and up to, um, you know, during their lifetime and to keep them safe during their lifetime. Um, liability is one key. Second one is trust. How can we build up this kind of trust chains? I mean, we see in IoT a lot of distrust now. And it's distrust between manufacturers and vendors. So can I trust my uh, supplier? That's a good question sometimes. Uh, I mean, we have seen fantastic IoT fails where companies were shipping products and then they found out that their suppliers just uh, have left back doors in the products. So how to make, how to create this kind of trust. And uh, last but not least, it's uh, a question of do we need, for example, uh, regulation in terms of certifications and trademarks? And uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is maybe a typical European perspective. So if we, if we don't, if the markets are not getting uh, into liability, do we need regulation? Uh, and uh, as we have seen now, for example, with uh, in the past 2016, we had Mirai as a botnet. It was a shake in the industry uh, because it was just this... Um, Minecraft, DDoS, uh, ransom guys from the US, not from Russia, not from <laughs> North Korea. It had been guys Isn't that funny, right? We've got our own homegrown terrorists. Exactly. The guys from the US, and I mean, let's call them kids, but brilliant kids in terms of that they can manage uh, a botnet with, where you need skills to deal with scalability. Um, but it was a shake in the industry because it has shown that easily within days you can create a botnet with 500,000 or a million devices connected to it, which have been mainly IP cameras uh, with some easy backdoors. Um, but what we have seen there is um, these products are going to market because the supply chain is so complicated to deal in security. So maybe we need a certifica uh, certification uh, for IoT devices, just uh, with a where you have a process implemented for quality management and quality assurance, and uh, if everybody in the in the supply chain is keeping this kind of level of uh, security assessment, uh, consumers can to be sure that the product they bought um, there are safe products and there will be not backdoors to to their own intranets. There will be not backdoors. Um, to mine uh, cryptocurrencies, there will be not backdoors to access on your video streams or unlock your smart lock for your home and all that stuff. I mean, um, or um, that someone will talk through your smart toy teddy bear yeah. to your children and stuff like that. I mean, uh, this is really scary if you if you look what's what's going on in the market. So. <laughs> If industry will not fix it, I believe that some regulations will take in place. And I like the point you make because it's a really interesting point, right? What's the balance between big brother government versus the industry themselves? 
And I, I think that what we may find is that, yes, that accountability, I mean, that's number one, right? Because people vote with their wallets. So once it starts impacting them, now, now they're going to start thinking twice. And, you know, if you look at what's happening with GDPR, with the data privacy laws, even companies that are not based in Europe, they're starting to talk about, oh, maybe we need to also have similar kinds of uh, either regulations or maybe voluntary processes in place, because that's becoming the gold standard. And then people, meaning the industry, the market will vote with uh, who's going to be protecting their best interests. And it's always a chaos, uh, a question of what is happening on, you know, what is happening in this uh, cyberspace stuff. It's like, I believe that uh, even in the US, uh, the breach of all your social data, which has occurred, it was really a shake as well for US citizens to see that uh, data privacy is something really important. So. To me, uh, I mean, we can discuss a lot about GDPR if this is a good solution or not. But even what I was uh, rather surprised that people in the US said, yeah, well, there's a reason why Europe is introducing the GDPR. Companies have to be more aware when they deal with data of private persons and of persons and personal data and stuff like that. And maybe the same will happen to the IoT space because currently what we see is Wild West. We see Wild West and, and we see there are a lot of problems um, happening. And even these problems are affecting the industry as well. Uh, like what will happen if you can't sell a product anymore uh, because there's no trust in the market? Right. And it's absolutely imperative that we develop this trust because whether we like it or not, the world is becoming connected. So this is definitely yeah. a problem we need to solve. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're, and, and, and just because it's a, so a complicated problem, I think it's not only one stakeholder can solve it. We need many stakeholders who are working to get to, to do that. And what we see is, yeah, there's more responsibility now coming into the market for CEO, industrial companies taking care and responsible. Um, I mean, I've heard the CEO of a large um, airplane manufacturer that he said, Oh, I'm really a little bit concerned because I know in our airplanes, there are 50,000 sensors continuously sending data to the ground stations and we have a Wi-Fi entertainment system on board as well. Um, so, and on the other side, I hear people, you know, from, uh, you know, this kind of intelligence services who are telling what's, what's going on, like in, in terms of cyber weapons and stuff and how cyber weapons are built up on private infrastructure which means just on, on, on IoT devices and they're really concerned. And, and then um, we are all customers ourselves and we're buying these products and then we have sure. to, you know. I mean, who doesn't have an Alexa or some kind of connected device in their home, right? Exactly. And you're buying these brilliant toys for your children and you have to be sure that the toy you're buying is really safe and secure because I don't want to be my, my child exposed to the internet. I mean, that's, uh, and that's really a, a topic uh, we see where a lot of stakeholders are coming into place. And, and just, you know, for example, for, for, for my, my own personal role, you know, I'm a father of a child. So yeah, okay. So I'm really thinking about, you know, how to make uh, IoT products safe because I want, I really want that she can play with her products and all the devices she has, uh, that she is safe in a safe environment. And uh, for example, that's one reason why we, why we are working with Ashwin on this um, IoT updating and patching solutions. Because what we have seen now in the market is that the most problem is during um, everyone wants to save money and there's less maybe consciousness in the for or at developers and vendors that their products out there need to be patched uh, five years or 10 years or whatever, um, that we are building a solutions where they easily can manage that, you know, that challenge, because it's also a, a challenge on profit and how to, how to make valuable products during the lifetime. 
and, and then, you know, the resources that it takes to apply those patches as well. Yeah, and, and how to make it uh, to, to make it stable enough, you know, like what we see from the attacker side, you know, there's a lot of question about, you know, what's going on in this kind of cybersecurity market. And we have players, of course, we are thinking about structures, how to make it safe and secure, even, for example, how can we apply patches safe and secure? But on the other side, the attackers are... I mean, they're watching our systems and they're just always trying to find out where are the weak points. And for example, if we apply patches from central services to the devices, um, it's even from an economic side, rather easy now for an attacker to just uh, disturb this updating and patching services because they just have to go to the dark net, uh, spend, I mean, spend one ether for a DDoS attack and they can simply tear down my whole patching infrastructure patching and infrastructure and it costs them you know if you take the ethers it costs them maybe a hundred dollars wow and and for a hundred dollars they can just bring me as an as a company so under pressure i mean i will pay whatever i do um or they can take down you know they can overtake the devices uh, within the time my patching stuff is down so I think this kind of of attacks are getting more and more feasible from an economic side, even for the attackers. And for the companies, it's rather hard to prevent from that. Yeah, and you know, I'm so happy you're talking about that because it's very important that we as an industry understand what the challenges are that face us. I mean, we can no longer just keep our heads in the sand and go, oh, cybersecurity, that's like something big companies worry about or something the government needs to worry about. This is something that affects each and every one of us. Yes, it, it does. You know, we are, we, are, we are part of the industries and we are consumers as well. So whatever we, we should do, even if, uh, if I'm an IoT manufacturer and some one of my engineers will tell me, oh, no, we don't have to think about patching and security of my, ma you know, my managers will tell that because it costs us only money. I would say, well, if you have ch ch children, you know, or your consumers as well, do you want to have this kind of product? If there is no sustainable security inside the product, you want your smart home mining cryptocurrencies for <laughs> someone else and you're paying for the energy? I mean, that's... At least let it mine, mine bitcoins for me, right? <laughs> exactly. If I want to mine cryptocurrencies, I want to earn them. Um, that's what's going on out there. It's completely crazy. So, Miracle, let's talk about blockchain. You know, it's been yeah. touted as a digital Fort Knox impervious to attacks and virtually unalterable. But is that really yeah. true? I mean, it's like if you look at this kind of Gartner cycles, I believe that blockchain is really on the top of it. So um, what we have seen in the past that many people are just talking about that they're using blockchains because they want to attract investors or... Uh, want to be sexy as a startup as well. Uh, to be honest, at Ashwin, for this uh, patching and updating, we are using blockchain as well. Um, and we said, yes, in terms of investors, we have all the buzzwords inside. Uh, you can now love at the market. It's IoT, it's uh, security, cybersecurity, and it's blockchain. Okay. You check all the boxes. <laughs> yes, check, check, check. But uh, for some reasons, it's makes really sense to use blockchain because what we see in the current situation is that uh, many of this updating and patching solutions are centralized networks so it's re rather easy to disturb them uh, by for attackers like i said you would just simple make a ddos uh, on the updating servers and uh, many of the vendors are not able to update any more the devices. So for that reason, for example, blockchain makes sense because you have this kind of distributed uh, ledger where you can even use a distributed infrastructure for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, updates. And the second one is the big question of trust. As you said, like we have to trust, we, we both have to trust because, uh, and even, you know, as a personality and, uh, Trust means that in behind we have ID, so we have an ID card and stuff like that, and fingerprints and, and whatever. Uh, 
But even in an interconnected world, uh, the, the devices needs trust. An updating server needs trust that he is delivering the right updates to the right devices and that not someone else is just trying to catch uh, the update files or, or the devices who receives the updates needs trust uh, that this file is really delivered from the updating authority or, uh, or yeah. system. So uh, we need this kind of trust layer. And what we see is that blockchain can provide this layer perfectly better than any other systems we see currently out there. So for that reason, yes, blockchain has in many, in many cases, like this in terms of uh, you need trust, uh, you need a distri distributed ledger is, uh, is rather cool for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer stuff. If you have this kind of um, architecture uh, and it makes sense for your business model, it's great, you know. You know, I never thought of that, that um, the actual patches may be a, an attack in disguise coming from some unknown source. And here we are, we're trusting them. We're giving them the keys to our front door. Come on in and patch our devices. But that may be an attack. Yeah, that's an attack because if you want to create a botnet, that's simply what you're doing. You have to uh, take control over the device and... Uh, and then you have to protect uh, the device from other botnets operator to do the same. <laughs> so, or from the vendor to just get control back on the device. And what you're doing, one attacking vector is just simple apply a patch on that device. And this patch is just changing the firmware of the device and it will close all open doors, all vulnerabilities. <laughs> well, that's a service. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other side, <laughs> It will guarantee the attacker uh, that he has that he will keep full control over the device. So, well, yeah, that's and that's the, the reality. Reason. That's the world that's, we live in today. That's the reality, and that's the reason why a device should have be a trust layer to know that the patch it's receiving is really from from the system yeah. which has the authorization. Yeah. Now. Talking, uh, so just continuing along this line with the blockchain though, blockchain yeah. has a very unique vulnerability in that it's still vulnerable to the person that has access to it. Yeah. It's, yeah, of course. It's like right? there's, there's always that human element. There's always a human element in, inside. And um, I mean, whatever you do in cybersecurity, we will not get 100% security. We can get 99.999.999%, but it's always a question of um, usability, then a question of layer eight. So uh, which persons are, uh, what capability they have. So call it user experience, for example. Um, and it's an economic, economic question. So how much you want to spend in security or how much you can spend in security. Um, and the products are still creating revenues or you have a sellable product or the price is acceptable. So that's the trade off we have in security. Now we have a question from the audience. The question is from Ken Heron, who's a chief marketing officer of intelligent IOT messaging company, Unified Inbox in Orlando, Florida. So, Ken says, Mirko, we know you're a genius and the guy for IoT. So here's my question. Many companies are just now understanding the impact that doing IoT will have on their business. It's called business transformation for a reason. For companies who feel like they're a little behind in getting started, what is your advice to help them to get the most out of their IoT investment? Oh, that's a hard question, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, what we see now currently in the market, what, what we've seen with a lot of companies that they are starting to do IoT uh, with no idea what could be the business model in behind. That's what we see a lot. It's even like the same with the big data topic. 
so that you say, well, there is no, for example, there's no big data without IoT. For sure, I believe that because you need all the sources to collect data. But then to create a, a business revenue model out of that is rather hard because everybody is trying to find uh, the gold neck there. Um, I mean, where I really see that uh, IoT brings value, for example, from a vendor perspective is, of course, you can just reduce costs. So for example, we have a lot of uh, customers seen out there who had rather complex um, control units uh, or user control interfaces as, as part of their devices. And now they can just reduce uh, or substitute this by a mobile app. So the smartphone is getting the controller to a mobile device, which means by IoT, they're just saving costs because uh, they don't have to spend money on that unit on for the device. Um, and this is, um, I think this is a perfect entry point if you are a vendor to start into the IoT world because you have a case where you can say rather easily, yes, by for example, making the smartphone to the controller of that device, uh, you just can save money uh, on a product uh, during the you know, production, production process. That's, I think, a good example. Um, but then they are stepping from a device manufacturer as well to a service provider, to a mobile service provider, and they have to deal with Apple and, and, and stuff and Google and stuff like that, which is rather rather different from their from their existing business model. So oh, what's the advice? I don't know. I have no advice. That I, I think the best is just, um, of course, always the, the, the best advice is to look on the market and to see which products have failed. Because if you know which products have failed and you have a clear vision about why they have failed, because it was a uh, lack of competence, <laughs> maybe, uh, or it was really one because the product is, um, it makes no sense, you know, then you're getting maybe a, be a better understanding for your own company, which could be IoT products, uh, uh, where you can get your value out of the IoT. I like that. Look at where other people have gone wrong, learn from their mistakes. Don't make those mistakes and apply those lessons learned to your business. Yeah. That's maybe one thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's sage advice for anything in life. Yeah. Mirko, who would be an ideal client for your business? Ah. Oh. What I really, you know, for example, when we take Ashwin with this IoT, you know, the updating business, the best client I can think is will be a big Chinese manufacturer for my, for Wi-Fi modules, <laughs> because I, I think so in Shenzhen, uh, because I believe uh, that we have to convince these people that it makes sense to bring in more security in their modules because they ship them in millions. I mean, all this 50 billion devices you were telling about at the introduction, and many of them have, you know, just components which are produced in Shenzhen. <laughs> so, and a lot of them, a lot of what we see are the problems are based in these modules. So if we can convince uh, them to use, for example, Ashwin, and with that, uh, it's going through the supply chain. At, at the end, uh, the manufacturer of the connected product so says, well, patching and updating is no problem because they're using Ashwin in behind. Uh, and this is the idea or the quality trusted by my Chinese manufacturer. Uh, this will be great. <laughs> yeah. And we'll all be safer because of that. Yes. yes. It's a win-win. <laughs> And then a trusted label outside, certified product, you know, trusted security, updating, lifetime patching, provided by Ashwin. Perfect. Perfect. All right. We'll get that taken care of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so, Mirka, when they're ready to call you, how, how would they connect with you? Oh, they can connect um, on many ways. First of all, we have, of course, a website. It's uh, ashwin.io. Um, and second one, they can uh, just contact me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. I think that's the, that's the best uh, channels. Great. And I'll post that to the show notes so people can just click right on that and get right to you. Yeah, that will be perfect. Yeah. Mirko, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? 
Boah, that's, uh, you know, like there's some jokes inside the net now. I think my words of wisdom, so I, I have to be careful with words of wisdom. No, um, no, what I really want to say is to everybody in the industry is uh, keep in mind that we are consumers as well. Whatever we do, we are consumers as well. So if someone is telling you we don't need that because it costs too much money and it's going towards security, keep in mind that we are consumers as well. Love that. Mirko, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thanks.